Okay, we are going to be in Psalm 100 this morning. Um, I was gone last week. Uh, my, my dad's um, kind of in bad shape. He's got uh, COPD, and so I went back to visit with him. How'd Matt do? Yeah, you liked him? Yeah. I like it that I can leave and, and we got good guys around here. So he taught about hell and you liked it, huh? Yeah. <laughs> oh, psalm 100. I wanted to do a Thanksgiving psalm. So Psalm 100. Why don't you all stand and let's go through and read it together and then we'll get into it. Verse 1, it says, Make a, sh a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Let's pray. Thanks, Lord, again for your word. Thank you for uh, the holidays that are coming up. Uh, Lord, we're uh, just thankful uh, for a day to be able to set aside uh, just to offer up um, gratefulness to you for what you've done for us, Lord. And as we're going through and talking about that this morning, Lord, we just pray that if we've uh, been in a situation where we're not recognizing your goodness, Lord, that you'd open our eyes. Uh, Father, uh, that as we're going through your word, we see how much you do for us, that we become uh, even more grateful than maybe we already are, Lord. We just, we just love you. Look forward to the time in your word. Just pray that you bless it and that you do this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. There's a man in Phoenix that calls his son in New York the day before Thanksgiving and says, I hate to ruin your day, but I have to tell you that your mother and I are divorcing 45 years of misery is enough. Pop, what are you talking about, the son screams. We can't stand the sight of each other any longer, the father says. We're sick of each other, and I'm sick of talking about this. So you call your sister in Chicago and tell her. Frantic, the son, calls his sister who explodes on the phone. Like, heck, they're getting divorced. She shouts, I'll take care of this. She calls Phoenix immediately and screams at her father, you are not getting divorced. Don't do a single thing until I get there. I'm calling my brother back, and we'll both be there tomorrow. Until then, don't do a thing. Do you hear me? And hangs up. The old man hangs up his phone, turns to his wife. Okay, he says, they're coming for Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> and they're paying their own way. <laughs> what are we going to do for Christmas? <laughs> I, you know, I... Um, you guys know I like Christmas. I, well, I love Christmas. I, li I like talking about Jesus coming, and I love Christmas. I'm, I'm just looking forward to Christmas a lot. But you know what? I like Thanksgiving probably at, at least as much, maybe more. Like, seriously, I like it a lot. Um, and uh, one of the reasons I like it is because there are no gifts. It's just a day, and we're going to honor the Lord, and we're going to thank him for everything that he's done for us. And there's football. I'm thankful for football. And there's food. I'm thankful for food. And there's family. And I'm thankful for family, most of them, anyway. You know, I'm thankful, thankful for them. A lot of times there's friends over. I'm thankful for them, mostly, once again. You know. And, uh, you know, we do, that, we do the whole thing where, where you go around the table and you do the Thanksgiving thing, you know, so what are you thankful for? What are you thankful for? We do that whole thing. So there's, you know, there's family and there's fellowship and there's food and all that stuff. There's turkey. Turkey is good. God, God is good giving us turkey. And I like turkey sandwiches. I like them a lot. And so when people come over for Thanksgiving, they don't get to take the leftovers. My wife tries to get them away, give them away. Yeah, you can have all the other stuff. You leave the turkey there. Don't you touch the turkey because I'm having turkey sandwiches. I don't care if I have turkey sandwiches all the way up to Christmas. I like turkey sandwiches. So Thanksgiving's cool. This is a psalm of Thanksgiving. In fact, it's the only one with a, the, the only psalm with uh, Thanksgiving in its title. Uh, uh, it specifically, it's titled a psalm of Thanksgiving. And um, I, you know, again, I think, I think that's, that Thanksgiving is, is something that's important. We need to be people who are thankful to the Lord. There's a guy named H.A. Uh, Ironside, Harry Ironside. 
um, who was in a crowded restaurant, and just as he was about to begin his meal, a man approached and asked if he could join him. And so Ironside said, sure, you can have a seat. Then as was his custom, Ironside bowed his head in prayer. And when he opened his eyes, the other man asked, do you have a headache? And Harry said, no, I don't. The other man asked, well, is there something wrong with your food? And Ironside replied, no, I was simply thanking God as I always do before I eat. I eat. That set the man off. And he said, oh, you're one of those, are you? Well, I want, to, I want you to know I never give thanks. I earn my money by the sweat of my brow, and I don't have to give thanks to anybody when I eat. I just start right in, he said. And then Ironside said, yes, you're just like my dog. That's what he does, too. <laughs> He's a rowdy old man. <laughs> in any case, you know, a lot of, a lot of times um, when you get around the Thanksgiving season, you know, you're going to get all the PC garbage where they go through and they start uh, talking about the first Thanksgiving and uh, they, they uh, tell people that uh, the pilgrims were thankful to Squanto instead of God. You guys know who Squanto Who doesn't know who Squanto is? Amazing. Get a new history teacher. Like, seriously. You know, Squanto was an American Indian, uh, Native American, and uh, when the pilgrims came over, he was uh, kind of the go-between between, between uh, the American Indians in the area and the pilgrims, specifically. And in fact, he helped these guys out as far as uh, knowing how to farm. Specifically, it was the American Indians that taught these guys how to grow corn. And so the, the story goes that Quant Squanto came up, showed them, how to, showed them corn, showed them how to plant it. And so you take a kernel of corn and they take a small fish and put it, put it in the hole with the corn. The fish was the fertilizer and that kind of stuff. And so first year, these guys had a real hard time as, as far as living. In fact, uh, 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 some people died that first year. Second year, they have a larger harvest specifically because of these guys. The pilgrims that came over, by the way, if April showers bring May flowers, what do May flowers bring? Pilgrims! Dad joke. <laughs> in any case, uh, the pilgrims, when they came over, these guys were uh, dyed-in-the-wool Calvinists, and uh, they were pretty rowdy, and uh, they didn't like the regular holidays. So they didn't keep Easter or Christmas. And uh, what they did do was they offered up thanksgiving to God routinely in the sense of they would, they would have days of thanksgiving. They would have days of fasting and days of feasting. And the feasting days were thanksgiving days. So they didn't just have fa thanksgiving once, uh, once a year on, on the fourth Thursday of the month or whatever the rule is, last Thursday of the month, whatever it is. I don't know what it is. I just show up. You know, it's like... In any case, they, didn't, they didn't, didn't just do it once a year. It was feasting or fasting. And so they were fasting when they felt like they needed to pray to the Lord. Or they felt that, like things were, were going bad, and they would proclaim a fast. And when uh, they felt the Lord's blessing, they would pro proclaim a feast. And that's what Thanksgiving was about. They invited a, a bunch of, the, of their neighbors there. In fact, I've got a, I'll, I'll read this to you. This is from Edward Winslow. Um, Plymouth, Massachusetts, December 16, 21. He's one of the pilgrims. He said, our harvest being gotten in, our, our governor sent four men on fowling so that we might after a special manner rejoice together after we had gathered the fruit of our labors. They four in one day killed as much fowl as with a little help beside served the company almost a week, at which time amongst other recreations, we exercised our arms. That means they went out shooting. Uh, many of the Indians amongst us and among the rest, their greatest king, Massasoit, with some 90 men, uh, whom for three days we entertained and feasted. And they went out and killed five deer, which they brought to the plantation and bestowed upon our governor and upon the captain and others. And although it be not always so plentiful as it was at this time with us, yet by the goodness of God, we are so far from want that we often wish you partakers of our plenty. They were thank giving thanks to God. It's something that we need to keep in mind when Thanksgiving comes along. Um, you know, uh, again, a lot of times what people are doing is replacing thanks to God to thanks to other people. And, you know, I, I watch TV around Thanksgiving time, and you see all the sitcoms and, you know, all the drama shows where they're sitting around a Thanksgiving table, and they do the same thing that we do in my house. What are you thankful for? You know, the bigger question is, who are you thankful to? You know, and a lot of times people, you know, try to 
you know, they, they just take the whole Thanksgiving thing and they just kind of make it a, a, I don't know, just a general thanksgiving. I'm just thankful. Thankful? Well, you know, when you're thankful, you're thankful to someone. And so if I do something for you and you say thanks, I say you're welcome, right? That's, that's what being thankful is. And in the same way, when you're looking at thankfulness to God, that's where it's supposed to be, be at. We're, we're thanking God, and God's going, you're welcome. And there, there's a relation that goes on there. General, you know, being generally thankful is like being generally faithful to my wife. I'm, are you faithful to your wife? Well, well, generally. Is that good enough? No, it's not. And so we need to be thankful to the Lord. In contrast to that kind of attitude, there's a specific thankfulness to God that the Bible talks about. Um, we're to give thanks to God because he's good. Psalm 106 verse 1 says, Praise the Lord, O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. And admittedly, there, there are times, and, and you know, generally speaking, I'm pretty, I'm pretty upbeat, um, but I recognize that there are times when your circumstances aren't good. I'm not thankful because my circumstances are good. Um, my circumstances aren't supposed to be what makes me happy or joyful. Um, in fact, the word um, happiness comes from happenstance, which is a synonym of circumstance. If your circumstance is what, what drives your joy, uh, you're not going to be joyful very much. But if your position with the Lord, the fact that he's with you, is what drives your joy, you're going to be joyful all the time, even in the midst of hard times. And God's not beyond obviously allowing you to shed tears. He collects them. You know, the Bible says that God takes your tears and collects them in a bottle. It's the idea, uh, actually, the Jews in ancient times, when they were mourning for somebody, they collected their tears in a bottle. They put it up on a mantle, and it was a symbol of how much you cared about your father who passed away or your mother who passed away or your wife or whatever. And God basically in that psalm is saying, you don't have to collect your tears. I collect them for you. And then the Bible says you're going to be in his presence and he's going to wipe them all away. Wipe them all away. That's the God that we serve. So circumstances may not be what you want. Holidays generally are a time of celebration, you know, plenty of food, and you've got good friends and, and you've got family. Um, sometimes that changes, and sometimes there's not so much to celebrate in those arenas. Maybe you're in a financial situation this year where you know, Thanksgiving's coming and you're not going to have the same spread on the table that you had last year. Um, maybe, uh, you know, there's going to be an empty place at the table uh, because of a death or because of divorce or because of abandonment. God sees all that. Maybe, maybe the, the place at the table is going to be empty um, just because people are gone. You know, you're older, your kid's going off to college, or somebody's gone off uh, for a job or, or something like that. Or maybe you're new in town, you're the new guy, and you don't know anyone, and you're alone. And it's hard to be alone on holidays, but you know what? If you follow Jesus, guess what you're not? Alone. Ever. Never alone. It's one of my favorite things about being a Christian. You know, there were all kinds of times uh, growing up where... I felt like I was all by myself in a room. And, you know, you, I've talked to you about my personality and kind of hanging back when I'm in a, in a crowd and, and that kind of thing. I was always the guy who listened to bread when I was a kid. How many of you know what bread is? Raise your hands. And all the rest of you, Google it. You, you, can, you can go on the Google, and you can Google it. <laughs> my sister makes fun of, yeah, whatever. Pew, pew. Anyway. You know, uh, you can be thankful for the fact that the Lord's with you. And again, the Bible teaches that we're not to praise God just because our circumstances are good. One of the best examples of that is Job. And you guys know the story I quote it all the time. But in Job chapter 1, the guy loses his children. He loses his flocks. He use, loses his wealth. He loses his servants. And we're talking getting killed. They get killed. He loses everything in a day. And when he gets to the end of that, when he gets the, the final message that comes in, this is what he says. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That is a guy 
who is not thankful because of circumstances. That is a guy who's thankful just because he follows the Lord. And obviously, he didn't necessarily feel thankful when those things were going on. There's a passage in, in Hebrews 13, 15, you guys are familiar with this, that talks about praise being a sacrifice. And it says, therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And so, you know, when, when you think about a sacrifice, uh, in, the, in the Old Testament specifically, a sacrifice was bringing your best. You had to bring the best that you had when you offered a sacrifice to God. Sacrifice also costs you. And so if it's just something that's, that's not a problem or it's just something that, that's, that it's kind of matter of fact, that's not really what a sacrifice is about. There are times when you're offering praise to God and it's literally a sacrifice. It's hard, Lord, for these words to come out of my mouth because I'm having such a hard time. That's valid, and I think that when you're, when you're talking about the worth of thanks, a lot of times it's in that situation that it's the best, that it's the most pure, that it's the most righteous before God. And so if you're going through a hard time this Thanksgiving, offer him thanks anyway. Looks good. The Bible says that praise is comely. Praise looks good. I memorized it in the King James. Praise looks good. And that's what we want. It looks bad when you're not thankful. Have you ever been around somebody who wasn't thankful? You do something for them. You, you know, it's like you literally sac sacrifice for them and, and uh, you, you, maybe you even slave for them. These are called mothers. And then they're not thankful. Ooh, what's that? I don't want to eat that. You know, it's like you just spent four hours at the, you know, at the, uh, in the kitchen and, and that kind of thing, and they're not thankful. And that doesn't look good. Just doesn't look good, right? Doesn't look good when, when you've done something for somebody. You know, some of, the, some of the most ungrateful people that I have ever met are Christians that I did the most for. Like, literally working on their houses, doing, you know, protecting them from weird husbands and, you know, all this stuff. And then, they end up mad at you and ticked off at you and don't like you anymore. Just ungrateful. Doesn't look good. There's a passage that deals with that. Turn over to Luke 17. Luke chapter 17. Luke 17, verse 11. Jesus is dealing with uh, 10 guys who are lepers. And it says in verse 11, it says, Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, were there not 10 cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And uh, you guys know something about Samaritans, or if you don't, um, the Samaritans came in after the northern kingdom of Israel was taken captive. And there were some uh, stragglers that were left in the land of Israel. And the Assyrians brought in a bunch of pagans uh, Gentiles from other countries, and these people intermarried. And so you kind of had a half-breed culture as far as the Jewish nation was concerned, and then they made up their own religion, basically. They took some of Judaism, and they took some stuff from their, from their other stuff, and they put it together. And so, so when Jews looked at Samaritans, they considered them to be half-breeds and cultists, basically. And so they didn't have a good reputation with the Jewish people, Thus, when Jesus is being kind to Samaritans, it made a real impact to the Jewish nation because these were people that nobody liked. And so in this instance, it looks like the, the, the other nine guys apparently were Jews. And it was the foreigner, the Samaritan, who came back. And Jesus makes a point of announcing this whole thing. And I don't know why the other nine didn't come back. Um, I kind of think it's because they felt entitled on some level. You know, it's like, oh, God healed us, and, and you know, now we're going to go. And they don't 
think, don't even think to turn around and come back and thank Jesus for what he'd done. Doesn't look good. Doesn't look good. Have you ever been to other countries? You know, uh, people run down America a lot in our country. And I think that most of them haven't been in other countries. And so I've been, I've been in other places. I've been in India. I've been in Uganda. Been in Israel. Been in Russia. Been in Europe. In different places. And you know what? I like it here. Been to Mexico. I like it here. We have it really good here. You know, the blessing of God is on this nation in all kinds of ways that a lot of people don't respect and they're not thankful for. And uh, if, there, if there's any place that um, I'm blessed to be, it's in America in the time that I'm living in. We just live in an amazing place. And uh, we're, we're the richest group of people that this world has ever seen. And we should be thankful for it. Um, I used to go to, well, actually, we, we'd go to Mexico. Uh, I had a boss that would uh, take me down to Mexico um, for, uh, you know, for like a bonus. And uh, so we'd go down and, and uh, uh, have vacation there. And obviously, uh, my wife came with us. And, and so, you know, we're, we're in a place that's really nice. And then we'd go out and visit around and, you know, go walk around and stuff like that. And, you know, if you've ever been to Mexico, you know, it's, it's like there's people who have and then people who don't. And the people who don't really don't. There's a, there's a, there's a wide cultural divide. And so the last time that we went, um, we came back, and it was in the late um, 80s. Uh, we came back, and as soon as my wife saw a picture of George H.W. Bush and the American flag on the wall, she started crying. And she said, I never want to leave again. <laughs> Just because, you know, the, the poverty was something that uh, she had a hard time with. We live in a blessed place, and we should be thankful for it. Um, Israel in the wilderness is another example of people who are unthankful. These guys are delivered from uh, slavery in Egypt. And there's 11 miracles that God does when he's delivering them out of Egypt. First one is Rod turns to a snake. You know that whole story. And then it's the, the Nile River turns to blood, and then there's frogs, and then there's flies, and then there's lice, and then there's, and it goes down the, down the list of 10 different plagues that come on the Egyptians, and every one is, an, is a miracle until finally Pharaoh goes, okay, let him go. And then they get up against the, the Red Sea, and Pharaoh figures that they're lost in the wilderness, so he sends out his chariots to go and get them, and so God gets in between them and Pharaoh. And the Bible says there's a pillar of fire. It's a pillar of fire on one side, and it's darkness on the other side, and the, the Egyptians were afraid to cross over, and God protected them for the whole night while he blew wind on the Red Sea and, and made, you know, made walls of water on either side with a pathway through the Red Sea. They walk through the Red Sea. It comes down on the, on the chariots of Pharaoh, and they have a day where they're rejoicing. And three days later, they're griping about we don't have any water. That's crazy. That's crazy. God gives them water, and then God gives them food. You know, manna. You guys remember manna? You know what God calls it? Bread from heaven. He calls it angel food. That's what God calls it. You know what manna means? What is it? That's what your kid says when you bring a new plate of new stuff. What is it? <laughs> it's manna, right? And they're griping about manna. You know what the Bible says about manna? It's like wafers made with honey. It says it's like, it, it, was, it, was like, it was like flour cooked in oil. Do you know what this is? Donuts. <laughs> God's feeding them donuts from heaven, of all things. And they're griping about it. Oh, there's only this manna to eat. All I see is manna. I had banana bread yesterday and manna cotty, and I'm done. No more manna. Can God give us meat? We remember the meat and the, you know, the flesh pots of Egypt and the, just that, flesh pots. Who says flesh pots? The flesh pots of Egypt and the leeks and the onions and the garlic, their breath reeked. You know, I can't believe the, the Egyptians wanted them as slaves. It's like, get out of my house. You stink. You know, anyway, 
That's what they're remembering. And God goes, okay, you want meat? I'll give you meat. I'm going to give you meat all month. I'm going to give you meat until it comes out your nostrils. Don't you love God? It's like, <laughs> God just gets done with him, and it's like, coming out your nostrils. You want meat? This is what you're going to get. And so, again, ungratefulness. Given to the Lord, the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Psalm 29.2. Uh, Romans 1.21 talks about an unthankful heart. It says, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. It's amazing how often unthankfulness and darkened hearts go together. It's amazing. In the Bible and outside the Bible, too. Cicero said this, gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but the parent of all the others. Good point. And so gratitude's important. Psalm, back to Psalm 100. Turn back over there. Let's get into it. When you go through this psalm, the first thing that you see is worship. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Worship. And if you take worship and divide it into two parts, actually, I like to do it this way, worth-ship. When I'm thinking of worship, what I'm thinking of is the fact that God is worthy. When I, when I sing to the Lord... That's what I'm recognizing, that God is worthy of my praise. Otherwise, all it is is singing. It's not worship. It's just singing. And one of, the, one of the problems that I had with singing when I was first a Christian was the fact that I wasn't really impressed with my own, you know, uh, voice, basically. You know, it's like coming to this place, and I, you know, I, I just came from a world where you never sang. You know, it wasn't like I was going through my house singing all day long. And the only times that I ever really sang was when I was in my car with the radio cranked up and, you know, singing at the, at the top, well, not the top of my lungs because I wanted the radio to drown me out and, uh, and that kind of thing. Then I come into a place like this, totally foreign to me, and all these people are singing, and they sing a lot over and over, you know, and it's like for a long time. And I didn't know anything about church, and so I just, I just kind of went with the flow. I, I figured, these people know what they're doing, and so I guess this is the time when we're supposed to be singing. And I didn't know the words, and um, actually, uh, when, when I first started going to church, we sang out of our Bibles. And so we didn't have words up on the, up on the wall or anything. They would just say, you know, open up to Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence. With... I could sing it for you right now. Actually, it's my, my mother-in-law wrote the song. And so I could, I could sing it for you right now, but that's what we would do. We'd just go through the Bible, and we'd sing the songs that you have out of Scripture. Um, and a lot of times, actually, one of the things that they pointed out was this passage right here, verse 1, make a joyful shout to the Lord all you lands. King Jimmy says, make a joyful noise. So sometimes when people come in and sing here, it's not very melodious, it's just noisy. And God likes it. God likes the noise. He doesn't care if you have a great voice. He doesn't care. He just likes the worship. He likes the fact that you love him and that you'd offer up your love to him in song. Um, when you're talking about worship, presence is always emphasized. The presence of God is always emphasized. It's always about him. It's always about meeting with him. In fact, uh, many times, you know, there's all kinds of songs in, in the book of Psalms. You know these, these are all songs, right? And so some of them are calls to worship. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he's our God, and you know, so on. Come, that's the idea of I want you to come with me. And some of them are talking, witness song, basically talking about the Lord. Psalm 97, the Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice, let the multitude of isles be glad. You're talking to somebody else about who the Lord is. But the songs I like the best are the ones where I'm just talking to Jesus, where it's just me and him. And a lot of times I'll take the we songs, we, you know, we worship and adore you, bowing down before you, songs of praises, singing, you know, hallelujah, hallelujah is ringing. It's an old song, but we worship. And a lot of times I'll take and change the pronoun. I worship and adore you. I bow down before you. And, and so on. It's all about meeting with him. It goes on and says, verse 2, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before, again, his presence with singing. So I'm supposed to be serving the Lord with gladness. Gladness means joy. It means mirth. It's the idea of I'm having a good time here. And, you know, it's, it's good when we're serving the Lord 
um, obviously to be involved in God's work. And one of, the, one of the things that always amazes me is that God even uses me. And, you know, I know it's the same thing with you. One of the things I learned early on is I didn't have to know everything to be able to serve Jesus. I didn't have to have all the answers down. I didn't have to know my Bible back and forth, you know, backwards and forwards before I could go out and tell somebody about Jesus. Everybody has a story about what Jesus has done with them. It's called your testimony. What did Jesus do with you? And it doesn't mean that you don't need to be reading your Bible or finding things out. That's a good thing to do to have some answers. But you've got the major answer already. Has Christ come to you, into your life or not? Did he change your life or not? What were you before? What are you now? What's, what's Jesus been doing with you lately? And so we have lots of things to talk to people about. But again, when, when I think about the, the stuff that God does with me, I'm pretty amazed by it. Um, you know, th this is on the, on the same level as when I was a kid, my dad would let me do, uh, um, he let me work on the car with him. And so I'd do tune-ups with him. I did this with my son, Nathan. When he, uh, when he turned about eight years old, or eight years old, when he got into eighth grade. <laughs> when he got into eighth grade, the second service. And so you get what you get, man. <laughs> when he got into eighth grade, he just started getting useful. And so he start, he's getting big enough, and he's starting to get strong enough to do stuff. And so if I'm, if I'm out working on the car, I'd, I'd work on the car with him. So if I'm going out to do a brake job, then, you know, I got to... I got to take the tires off, and, and so I'd bust the lugs loose, and then he'd take the lugs off. And I'd bust the tire loose, because it's usually stuck on there, and then he'd take the tire off. And then I'd bust the caliper loose, and then he'd take the, you know, the bolts out of the, out of the caliper, and so on and so forth, all the way through the brake job. I'd be showing him the things that needed to be done and, and that kind of stuff, and then we'd put it back together. He'd, he'd put the bolts back in, and, and I'd, I'd torque them down. And same thing, you know, and, and is he doing the job? Is he helping me? Is he actually kind of in my way? Could I get it done faster without him? Yeah, absolutely. That's how it is following Jesus. You know, I'm not, I'm not here. Jesus isn't going, oh, no, what am I going to do? Steve didn't show up. You know, he's not doing that. He's, he's got all kinds of stuff that he can do on his own. And what he allows me to do is take part with him. And one of the things that, that I really liked about uh, when, when my dad would... Um, let me do the car with him when he'd let me do tune-ups and stuff like that. I knew that I wasn't helping. I knew that he could do it faster without me. I like the fact that he wanted to be with, the, with me. I like the fact that he wanted to show me stuff. I like the fact that he just wanted me to be around to help him. And that's exactly what it's like with Jesus. He wants me to be around to help him. And so I'm just totally blessed by the fact that I get to use, get, be used by God. Aren't you? You blessed by that? When you get to talk to somebody about Jesus, when you get to counsel somebody and they actually take, take your counsel, you get to lead somebody to the Lord, those of you that have led somebody to the Lord, you get to take some of the pain off of somebody uh, just because, of God, because God put you in the right place at the right time to help out, that kind of stuff. You like serving God? It's a, it's a very cool thing. And so we're to serve him with joy. We're to serve him with gladness. Next point that he makes is, Know that the Lord, he is God. It's he who made us and not we ourselves. A lot of times people think that they're self-made. I'm a self-made man, like the guy in that story. No, you're not. The Bible says that God gives you breath. The Bible says that God gives you the ability to work. The, God, the Bible says that God places you in the time and the place where you're at so that he can bless you. And a lot of times the Bible teaches that people who are around the followers of Christ are getting blessed just because they're around the followers of Christ. And so God's the one who's involved in all that stuff. He can take, you, take your breath away anytime that he wants to, and he doesn't. And he can, he can make your life miserable anytime that he wants to, and he doesn't. In fact, most times when our lives get miserable, it's because we're flat out in rebellion and what's, uh, against what God has told us to do. We're doing exactly the opposite. God's the Lord. He's God, not me. I, I like knowing that there's a father who's above me. You know, and you guys know something about my background. I, you know, if you don't, uh, my mom was married a bunch of times and had live-in boyfriends and, and that kind of stuff. And so just junky background. And the whole father thing, uh, when I first became a Christian, um, I, you know, I, I know that there are people who have 
a struggle with the father thing. Um, I never did. Because you can learn what a good father is by a, by a good example, and hopefully that's where most of you are at. Everybody who, who's here who has a kid, that's where your kid should be at. But you can learn from a good example. You can learn from a bad one, too. And so there was all kinds of awful stuff that happened in my house that don't happen in my home now. I know what a good dad looks like, and I knew what a good dad looked like as soon as I became a Christian. I never put that garbage on God because that none of that stuff was what God had done with me. It was what somebody else had done. And the longer that I was a Christian, the more I realized that most of the junk that was going on in my household was because of flat-out rebellion against what God had said. And we're getting the consequences of that. You can learn from a good example. You can learn from a bad example. But what we've got with our Father in heaven is a guy who always does it right. He's always got your back. He always cares about you. Even when he's allowing you to go through stuff, he's got a reason. It's not pointless. He hasn't forgotten you. He hasn't looked off. He didn't go, squirrel, you know, and, and leave you to your own stuff. He knows exactly what's going on in your life. And the things that he allows in your life are things that are necessary. They're necessary. Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. He never said that he wasn't allowed, going to allow me to go through things. He said he was going to be with me while I was going through them. That's a dad. That's a father. That's, that's, how, that's how the Lord is. You know, we have the Lord's prayer, our father who's in heaven, right? I like that. He's, he's got oversight. He's got overwatch on me. He knows what's going on. He's got my back. And then the second thing that he s says in that passage is that um, he's God. It's he who's made us, not we ourselves. He's the creator. He's the creator. And again, he, he gives me life and breath. There's a passage in Acts 17, 25 through 28, where Paul's talking to uh, a bunch of Greeks in Athens, and he says, human hands can't serve his needs for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. From one man, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, and some of your own poets have said we are his offspring. So he's our creator, and we should be thankful for that. He's our shepherd, too. He's our shepherd. It says at the end of verse 3, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. There's a Psalm, Psalm 95. Why don't you turn over there real quick? Turn one page to the left. Verses 1 through 7. It says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. So not only is he my father, not only is, my, is he my creator, he's my shepherd. Let's talk about being a shepherd for a little bit. Turn over to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. This is good stuff, Maynard. This is a passage where, where Jesus is talking about his relationship with us and the fact that we're sheep, he's the shepherd. And he's not just a shepherd, um, he's a good one. It says, verse 1, Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they don't know the voice of strangers. And we're not, we're not used to this, uh, this language here. A sheepfold was basically a big pen. And so it was a walled pen. It had four walls in it, and it had a door cut into it. And so it's high enough that the sheep or the goats couldn't jump out. 
and the doorway was usually just open. And when, when you were a shepherd and you were coming into town, for example, and you had to go do some business, you would take your sheep to a sheepfold and there would be a gatekeeper there. And he'd just basically stand in the doorway, make sure that the sheep weren't um, getting out and make sure that you know, nobody's coming to steal the sheep or anything like that. And so he'd watch your sheep for you. And it wouldn't just be your flock. It could be all kinds of flocks in there, depending on the size of the, of the sheepfold. And so when the shepherd came back from his business, he'd go up to the gatekeeper, say, I'm here. Gatekeeper would know who he was, and he'd call his sheep out. He didn't go in and grab each sheep and drag it out. He'd just walk in and call the sheep out, and the sheep knew his voice. And so his sheep would come out, and the other sheep would stay there because they don't know his voice. And this is true about sheep. I've told you about sheep at my house. And so I am not the shepherd. My wife is the shepherdess. And so when I go out and I tell the sheep to do something or I call to the sheep, unless I have food in my hands that they can see, they don't want to come near me. But if my wife goes out, the sheep just come up and, oh, it's Bobby, the shepherdess. And, you know, they'll follow her around and, and that kind of thing. And that's what Jesus is talking about. And so the, the picture of the voice of the shepherd, they know the shepherd's voice and they follow him. Then you have the picture of the door. In verse 7, well, verse 6, it says, Jesus used this illustration, but they didn't understand the things which he spoke to them. Then he, Jesus said to them again, most assuredly, I say to you, I'm the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I'm the door. If anyone enters by me, he'll be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And so that whole picture of somebody who doesn't come through the doorway, if you're climbing over the wall of the sheepfold, it's because you're up to a nefarious purpose. You're an evil man. You're coming to do something to the sheep. If you're going, through the, going up through the doorway, you belong there. And in this instance, Jesus says, I'm the door. And what he's talking about is what shepherds would do when they stayed overnight. So they want their sheep, in a, they're in a place where there's a sheepfold. They put the sheep in the pen, and then they become the gate. And they sleep across the doorway. So that if any of the sheep um, get out or try to get out, what they have to do is they have to trample the shepherd to get out of the sheepfold. Isn't that interesting? Because a lot of times what happens is we'll become sheep, and he puts us in the sheepfold, and then we want to get out. Right? I want to get out of here. And what you have to do to get out of the sheepfold is trample all over Jesus. And it's just a practical thing, too. If you're sitting there sleeping in the doorway and the sheep try to get out, you, go, you wake up and you go, what are you doing? <laughs> get back in there. And you drive the sheep back in, inside. Same thing with Jesus. He gives us life. He gives us life. He says, the thief doesn't come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. You know, I used to be a partier, and I used to do all the stuff, all, you know, all, all the stuff, you know, sex and drugs and rock and roll, not drugs so much, but, you know, did, did all that stuff, and then I'd become a Christian, and I would look at Christians, and I thought that they were all bound up and couldn't do anything, and I've never had more fun uh, in the world than I, than I have being a Christian. In fact, most people... Uh, that I've run into over the years. We, you know, we've had New Year's parties. You know what you do at a New Year's party? You know what people in the world do at a New Year's party? Yeah, they get blasted. We don't do that. And so my wife's had New Year's parties where we've done skits and, you know, we're, where we've dressed up in costumes, where, you know, all, kind of, all kinds of crazy stuff. We invite people over and they're just blown away because we're just rolling on, you know, it's like rolling on the ground laughing, your stomach hurts, kind of stuff as we're doing all these things, making fun of each other and that kind of stuff. Spoons. Have you ever played spoons? Hilarious. And so people, people will come, you know, come to something that admittedly my wife's putting on as far as a, a, as a party goes, and they would say things like, I have never had so much, I can't believe you're having this much fun and you're not drunk. And that's how the world thinks. Jesus came to give life and life more abundantly. It's better here than it was there is again the point. He says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who's not the shepherd, one who doesn't own the sheep, sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep, flees, the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he's a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. 
I know my sheep, and I'm known by, by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. Look at uh, verses 17 through 18. Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This command I've received from my Father. Jesus lays down his life for you. You already did it, right? And, um, you know, the Bible talks about the love that the Lord has for us, and it's a love that drove him to his death for you and for me. Jesus doesn't owe me a lot. The fact that he died for me, that's a little over the top. It's a little over the top. And so I'm not looking for more. I get more, but I'm not looking for it. I think he's done enough, don't you? Do you think he's done enough? I'm pretty grateful for that in the first place. He knows us too, 14 through 16. I'm the good shepherd, I'm known by my own, I know my sheep, 15. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. I lay my life down for the sheep, verse 16. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Um, how many of you are not Jews? Raise your hands. Okay. So really all the rest of you are Jewish? <laughs> that verse is about you. Jesus is talking to a bunch of Jews right here, and he's saying, I've got another flock, and they're coming in. And that's all of us. We get to come in on top of what the Jews have going. And then finally, he says he protects us. Verse 27, he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one's able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. This is the way that reads in Greek. My sheep keep hearing my voice, and I, know, I keep knowing them. They keep following me, and I keep giving them eternal life. And they shall never, no, never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. That's a pretty cool promise. Um, here's another thing. He talks about they're not going to snatch them out of my hand. That's one. Not going to snatch them out of the Father's hand. That's the other one. How's that work? Am I in two places at one time? Or maybe it's like this. God does that with you sticks you in the middle. He's watching out for you. He's watching your back. Nothing can get you. Nothing can get you. And so we, we have the Lord as our shepherd. Back over to Psalm 100. Let's wrap this up. He talks about enter his, entering his gates with thanksgiving. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. That's another psalm. Uh, it's a song from when I was a kid. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him. Bless his holy name. So on and so on and so on. <laughs> it's better if when I'm singing with a guitar. Sorry. In any case, we enter in his gates with thanksgiving. You know, there's a Psalm, Psalm 122. It's another song. I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. And... Uh, uh, there's, a, there's, there's joy, and there's, there's, again, there's a joy of fellowship. There's a joy of cleansing. There's a joy when we get together and meet. I, one of my favorite things is to walk in here when you guys are singing, still to this day. When I, when I was a younger Christian, I, you know, a lot of times I'd be a little bit late, and it was fun when they opened up the doors in the foyer, and you can hear the voices of, of hundreds of people just singing to the Lord. It's just a really cool thing, and I'm still like that. I, I like that a lot. Um, I'm, the, again, be thankful to him, even when I'm anxious, even when I'm having a problem. Uh, you know the, the passage in Philippians chapter 4, it says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he's done. See that? Thank him for all that he's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So even when I'm having a hard time, even when I'm anxious about something, I'm supposed to be taking those things to the Lord, and if I'll take them to him, put them in his hands, and then thank him for what he's going to do and for what he's already done, I have a promise that God's going to give me peace in that. Paul and Silas in the, in the prison, in the book of Acts, are good. It's, a, it's just a great example of this. The Bible says that uh, what they were doing, this is out of Acts chapter 16, if you want to read the story, it says that what they were doing was 
sharing the word with people, and there was this lady who was demon-possessed. And she came up to them and started spouting things off, and finally Paul got tired of it and turned around and said, in the name of Jesus, come out of her, and the demon leaves, right? And the problem was that people were making money off her. And when they found out that their, that their, you know, their source of income was gone, they got really ticked off. They got Paul and Silas in trouble, and they got beaten, and they got put down into the innermost part of the dungeon, and their feet got put in stocks, okay? So whenever I think about this stuff, I just think practically speaking. So, you know, it's all day long. You know, they're, they're out there in the day. There's time for some kind of trial. They get beaten. After they get beaten, they immediately get put in the stocks. Do you think that the, that the jail guard was coming down for potty breaks? Can they move? Yeah. And so it gets nastier and nastier as you start thinking about the practicalities of that whole thing. They're sitting, in there, sitting there in robes. They can't move. And at some point, they're going to have to go. And guess where it goes? And now they're sitting in it. And the Bible says that at midnight, that Paul and Silas began to sing. And as they began to sing, there was an earthquake, opened all the doors to the prison. And when the, when the, the jailer came down, it looked to him like all the prisoners were gone, and he knew what the Romans would do to him uh, for losing the prisoners. And so he takes out his sword. He's about to fall on it, and Paul screams out, don't, don't do it. We're all still here. And the guy comes walking in, and the first thing out of his mouth is, what shall I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? And that guy gets saved right there. And then his whole household gets saved. And what God does is he takes a pitiful, raunchy, filthy situation that these guys had no business being in because they hadn't done anything wrong. In fact, they'd done everything right. And he takes that and he turns around with a miracle. He not only delivers them, he delivers this guy and his whole family. And now they're all going to heaven. And then the rest of the story gets good because Paul gets rowdy. So you should go read it. In any case, we need to be thankful in the midst of our trials. Harry Iron said, said this, we would worry less if we praised more. Thanksgiving is the enemy of discontent and dissatisfaction. Finally, um, again, we're not to be thankful just because our circumstances are good. We're to be thankful because the Lord is good. Verse, four, verse five, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Um, you know, most of us here are people who understand why we should be thankful to the Lord. We were in the world, and we turned away from that, from that stuff. We got tired of it, and we came into a relationship with Jesus. And then Jesus just immediately began changing our hearts, began making us something new. And it's a, it's a very cool thing. Um, part of the reason that that was able to happen in my life specifically is because his mercy is everlasting, right there. You guys know what mercy is, right? Mercy is not getting what you deserve. And I certainly did not get what I deserved. You know, uh, my, my wife is the principal at our school, and one of the things that we laugh about all the time are your little boys. You bring your little boys to school, your little boys have justice on the brain. It's like everything needs to be absolutely just. It needs to be, it all needs to be right. And if a, little, if a little boy gets accused of something and he didn't do it, he's outraged. Just outraged. I can't, I did not do that, you know, and that, that kind of thing. Justice, looking for justice. You never want to look for justice with God. Because God knows everything. He knows what you deserve. He knows exactly what you've done. You know, and you can, you can go through the, the commands. The Bible talks about the fact that the soul that sins, it shall die. It's, the, it's in the word. The soul that sins, it shall die. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so what we deserve, if you go looking for justice, what we deserve is to be a smoking little spot on the pavement someplace. And so never go to God go and you know, stand before heaven and go, give me what I deserve. You don't want to do that. Actually, it probably doesn't matter because what God's going to do is not give you what, you're do, what you deserve because his mercy is everlasting. And mercy is not, again, getting what you deserve. So there's a bunch of things that I deserved before I became a Christian. Lots of them. 
And a lot of the things that I did before I became a Christian, when you go through the Bible and you look at them, they, they deserve death. So, for example, you dishonor your father and mother, you know what the penalty was? Yeah, it was death. Yeah. Um, adultery, you know what the penalty was for that? Death, yeah. yeah. And you go, you go through and you, you look at a number of the issues that uh, people went through. You know, if you didn't keep the Sabbath day, you know what you got? Yeah, it was death. Penalty was death. And so the number of issues that you have in the Bible, you can go through and look at your old life and go, oh, death, 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 death. That's what I deserved. And I'm not even giving you the bad ones, right? And that's what I deserved. That's what you deserve too. But what God does is he gives us mercy. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5 says this, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace that you've been saved. And so if you're, you know, before you were a Christian, you're going along, you're doing what you're doing, and it's defiling. And it's something that's outrageous as far as heaven's concerned. And God is doing nothing but get, granting you mercy, retreating, the Bible says, to his mercy, retreating to his mercy, so that he can give you grace. That's the end of that verse. It's only by God's grace that you've been saved. And the grace that he wants to give you is good things that you don't deserve. It's good to get good things that you don't deserve because if you deserve them, what happens when you don't deserve them? If God's giving you, if God's giving you what you deserve, you only get those things when you deserve it. If God's giving you grace, you get them whether you deserve it or not. And that's what God wants to do with you. That's what he wants to do with me. And then the last verse says, and his truth endures to all generations. He's given us truth that spans generations. There's a passage in John 8, 31, where Jesus says, the truth shall make you free. Have you guys heard that? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And a lot of times when, when, you know, when I've seen that, I've seen it with news anchors. They'll go, you know, they, they've, they've found a scoop on somebody, and they'll go, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. It's kind of a condemnation on somebody. Yeah, I want to know the truth. Truth will make you free. This is what the verse actually says. Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. That's a little different, isn't it? You abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Nothing has freed me up more than following Christ. And again, I came out of a dark place. I came out of a dark world, and nothing has freed me up more than following Jesus. Remember that verse in John? He says, I came to give you life and that more abundantly. He wants to give you an abundant life. I have things that I don't deserve. I have things that, according to stats, should not be happening in my life. I've been married for almost 40 years now. That's crazy. That's crazy. And it's all because of the things that Jesus has done in my life. And I'm no different than you are. Um, actually, maybe I am. I got tired of it. I got tired of what I was doing. I got tired of what I was. I got sick of looking in the mirror and wondering what my problem was. I just got tired of it. You know, all the stuff coming out my nostrils. I got tired of it. You know the only time that I've ever had anything coming out my nostrils? It's when I was throwing up got tired of it. I've done, done a bunch of that stuff. Are you tired of it yet? Or are you just going to go on in your life and keep doing the same thing, keep doing the same thing, getting the same stuff, complaining about it and griping about your life and wishing that things were different, kind of? I know, I, I know that there's an attraction for you in coming into, into this place. I know that there is. Even if you're not a believer, I know why you're here. And the reason you're here is because you're sitting next to somebody or you're sitting around somebody that you see something in and you see the differences. I understand that. It's one of the reasons that I, that I, that I followed the Lord, because I saw the differences. And I understand that there's an attraction there, and I also understand that there's a repulsion there. I know that you, you look at them sometimes and you're like, oh, man, I wish I had that kind of life. And then other times they're talking Jesus and stuff like, oh, I wish I'd shut up. I understand all that. The Bible teaches that. You know, it talks about the, the fact that for, for some of us, we're the smell of life. And for others, we're the smell of death. Because both those things have to happen. 
There has to come to an end to what you are, what you're doing, where you live right now. That's death. And then you get life and the abundant one, the one that's overflowing, the one that you're looking at your friends going, I wish I had something like that. That's what God has for you. That's what he wants for you. And if you don't have that, um, part of the reason for that may be because, you know, maybe you don't know the Lord. The Bible teaches that in coming to, into a relationship with God, there's a process that has to take place. I have to come to the end of myself. And I have to go, I'm done with this, and I, I would like something different. It's called repentance. I don't want to live this way anymore. And so you have to repent. The Bible says repent, and you'll be saved. Then it's believe. And believe means trust. So you're going, to have to, you're going to have to stop trusting in yourself in the way that you're running your life, and you're going to have to start trusting in somebody else. You're going to have to follow someone. And that's what Jesus was talking about with the whole sheep picture. He's the shepherd. Good idea. Follow that guy. Instead of getting ripped off and, you know, ate up and, and, and wounded by the, by the people who are around you, follow the guy who's got your back. You follow the guy. And so there has to be a belief. I need to repent. I need to believe. I need to receive. The Bible says that as many as received him, talking about Jesus, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. Have you received Jesus? And if you haven't, you're not a Christian. You may be a churchgoer, and you may be a nice person. Christian and nice person are not the same terms, right? We know this, right? And so when I say you're not a Christian, I'm not saying you're a lousy punk. I'm saying you're not a Christian. And Christian and nice person is not the same thing. When I'm saying you're a nice person, I'm not saying that you're a Christian. I'm saying you're a nice person. And that's nice, but it's not nice enough to get you to heaven. To get you to heaven, you have to repent. You have to trust someone. You have to receive him. And then what God does is he forgives you. You know, um, one of the things that is the truth is that I have failed God miserably, and so have you. One of the things that's the truth is that I deserve judgment, and so do you. That's the truth. And a lot of times we go through life and we feel guilty about things, and what we want to do is we want to change the standard. I don't want to feel guilty anymore, and so what I'll do is I'll go, well, everybody else is doing it, so I guess I'm okay. And that may work for a while, and so with some people, it works a week, some people it works a month, some people it works for their whole lives. Everybody else is doing it. You tired of saying that yet? Works for their whole lives until they finally get sick of it and they're, start, they're tired of the junk coming out their nose. And they finally go, I'm tired of this. And what you need is not to lower the standard, what you need is to be forgiven. And God's got that set up for you. He's looking at you. He's been pouring out mercy on you all your life, all your life. And now what he wants to do is give you the good stuff. He wants to give you good things. And the first thing that he wants to give you is forgiveness. He wants to take away the guilt. He wants to take away the shame. He wants to make you right with him. He wants to make you somebody who's not worried about going to hell. And you are. He wants to make you somebody who's not worried about going to hell and make you somebody who knows you're going to heaven, not because you're so great, but because he's so great. He wants, to, he wants to, again, give you his grace. So, have you received Jesus? Have you repented? Have you believed on him? Have you trusted in him? Are you a follower of Christ? Are you a follower of Christ? And if you don't know the answers to those questions, then there's a good chance that, you don't, that you're not. And so what you need to do is you need to get in that place, become part of the flock, get in the sheepfold, go through the door, get there. And the way that you do that, again, is by receiving Christ. If you haven't done that, I'm going to give you a chance to do exactly that. I'm going to pray with you. And in the middle of that prayer, I'm going to ask those of you who don't know if you're going to heaven and you would like to, who don't know if you're forgiven and you would like to be forgiven, who don't know if you know God and you would like to know the Lord, you'd like to follow him, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand up and I'm going to pray for you. And uh, then I'm going to ask you to stand up and pray a prayer with me of confession. And I mean stand up. I'm going to ask you to stand up and pray a prayer with me of confession, asking Jesus to forgive you for your sins and to come into your life. Okay? So think about that for a minute, and let's do this. God, thanks again, Lord, for all that you've done for us. 
you are the good shepherd, and we are the sheep of your hand. As it says in this passage, we're, we're your people, and we're the sheep of your pasture. Lord, we thank you for bringing us into that place and, and uh, the blessing that we get because of it. Thank you, Lord, uh, for the fact that I don't go through a lot of the garbage that my life should have been. And it's all because of you. And uh, I'm thankful for that. Lord, we know that you have that for everybody in this room. There's not, some, there, there's not anybody in this room that you don't care about, that you don't want, that you wouldn't want to bring into your family. Um, you see them all. You've known them from, from before the time that the world was made. You formed them, the Bible says, you knit them in the womb. And God, you love them. Lord, I just pray that you'd help them to respond to your love. And while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, believers are praying. If you're here this morning and you know that you need Jesus, you know that you need to be forgiven, you want to know that you know that you're going to heaven, you want to be forgiven, if that's you, why don't you raise your hand up? I'm going to, I'm going to pray for you. Raise it up high so I can see it in the back. God bless you up in the front. God bless you too, man. Anybody else? I'm not going to take a long time here. You guys are adults. You've heard what I've been talking about. You know, you know that God's talking to you. And you can say yes or no. And God's not going to wipe you out if you say no. But what he wants is a yes. What he wants is you. And the only question is, do you want him? So do you? And if that's you, you raise your hand up. Anybody else? Okay. Let me pray for you. Thank you, Lord, for these that have raised their hands. And Lord, again, just pray that you give them the boldness to be able to stand for you and to confess you before men. And we just ask that you do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you guys that raise your hands, why don't you stand up, and I'm going to pray a prayer with you. You're already standing. Why don't you stand up, and I'm going to pray a prayer with you. And this is a prayer asking Jesus to come into your heart. And so why don't you, why don't you pray this out loud? You can sign it if you want. Um, pray this, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I know that I'm a sinner, that I've sinned against you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please write my name in your book of life and make me a Christian. I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you died for me. I thank you that you rose from the dead. I thank you that you're coming for me. Please fill me with your spirit. Give me the power to live for you. I give my whole life to you now. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right.